one question that came out of the uh, the tour of your shop, people, some people were disappointed. They didn't see a lot more shopsmith tools in your shop. Could, do you care to address that? Well, since I moved out here and I've got a dedicated shop area, I found that um, I was using the shopsmith mostly as a lathe and then I was piling tools onto it. I had my father's table saw um, when I moved out here. And so I was using that for table saw. Um, I was, before I worked at shopsmith, I had bought a little um, Delta Rockwell four inch joiner. It was on a stand. I had these things to start with. Yeah. And then uh, working at Shopsmith, I bought my own machine. It was, uh, you know, they, they let us put it on payroll deduction at no interest. How can you refuse that? So yeah. um, I had the, the Shopsmith equipment here, um, but I wasn't using it. And then I was gifted, well, I had to pay a little bit of money for it, for real nice record lathe. And so the, the shopsmith as a lathe became even less used. So I sold it to another shopsmith employee um, who never took advantage of the payroll deduction. I don't know whether you remember him, Dave Malls, who was in customer service. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he bought my machine and is still using it to this day out in Boulder, Colorado. Now, it's, it's funny how folks get... Um... I don't know what the word is. It's, it's, it's some sense of territorial, you know, it's like we're, we're part of a, of a family now, part of this clan, yeah. and we should all be doing things exactly the same. It's like, I'm sorry, if I had my dad's or grandfather's tools and I had an opportunity to use them, you better believe I would use them, you know? Um, I, I remember when I was new at Shopsmith, I had a guy taking a class from me and we were doing something, I forget what, let's say on a table saw, and we were using a jig to get an accurate cut. And he just about lost it. And it's like, look, I just spent thousands of dollars for this equipment. And now you're telling me I have to build or buy other things to use it. It's like, well, no, you don't have to. But for repeatability, we make these, these jigs. I mean, even the miter gauge wasn't a part of the original table saw. And eventually they realized that, hey, you know, we need to add some accuracy to this cross-cutting process. Let's build this thing that slides. And there wasn't a miter slot either. That all had to evolve into the tool. And, uh, you know, but there, there are some folks that believe that you, you, everything's got to be done only with the tools that are coming out of this box. And if you do anything besides that, you're somehow being disloyal. And I, I think that was maybe a little bit of a sense of the feedback I, I was getting was, gee, you know, he, he, a guy works for a company and he doesn't even use their tools. Uh, well, I imagine you, you use your shopsmith tools or, or shopsmith tools a lot more than most of us do, whether they're in your shop or not. Right. And um, I'm working on them every day at work. When I was working for Nick, uh, he had shopsmith equipment in the shop that I was working in. I've still got, you know, dust collector, planer, um, Belt sander on the power station um, are all shopsmith equipment. Um, so I'm still loyal to shopsmith. I don't have a Mark V anymore. Um, I've got the advantage of, of having a, a dedicated area for a workshop. And I, that's how I've set it up. Yeah. Um, so it's not 100% Shopsmith, no, but it's the way I like it. Um, there's nothing I've made on that equipment out in the shop that I couldn't have made on the Shopsmith. Um, there's uh, very little time-saving advantage to what I've got set up in the shop. I, I use the Shopsmith organizational for, uh, philosophy to plan my woodworking. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to do all the, the table saw joiner work first, and you have to have a good plan to know what you're cutting first. Um, that, that holds true in any 
woodworking shop. Um, then you go to um, the next thing, whether it, whether it's bandsawing curves or drilling holes, but you do all of those at the same time um, so that you're not moving back and forth from machine to machine in an individual individualized shop like that, or um, you're not changing setups back and forth in a shopsmith shop. So it's there's a, a philosophy and organization, a planning process that I learned when I was building projects on the Mark V that holds true today to anybody's shop, whether it's shops or not. And it's especially true on shopsmith shops. And that's why you know, using shopsmith equipment is probably more efficient than using standalone tools is because you're organized to begin with it. That's, that's also why either people hate it or they love it. That's why there's <laughs> this family of shopsmith owners around the country that all have the same mindset um, that they think alike, they work alike, they work on the same tools, um, but they think alike and work alike because they work on the same tools. Right. So, it's um, it, it becomes a family and a, you know, some people even say a cult like group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you know, that's, that's why I've deviated a little bit from, you know, having not having a Mark five anymore is because yeah. I could. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some of this equipment I bought before I worked at Shopsmith. So, yeah. Uh, I, now, it, 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 I knew that it, when I asked you that question that there was a chance that could uh, make you feel defensive about it, but you shouldn't because, you know, why not? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that we need to feel any way about another person's tools, right? I mean, it, how, what you choose to put on your hamburger doesn't affect my pleasure from my hamburger one bit. Right. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> thank you for addressing that. What one last topic of conversation I'd love for us to have, Jim, is I know that your name is on a couple patents. I know that your fingerprints are on a bunch of tools and innovations, whether that your name ended up on a patent or not. Um, what, which products? Oh, actually, I did have two questions. Hold on a second. I got to rethink myself. Oh, there, look at that. What was that for? Miter Pro? Pro. Ah, there it is. That's cool. Uh, Kathy had the front cover made into a plaque for me. That's awesome. Um, that, that's the only one that's got my name on it alone. The Miter Pro is the only one that I, I can claim myself. The Shopsmith dust collection valve I developed, but it was I didn't get a patent on that. Um, I'm named as... Um, one of the team on the 510 patents. Um, You're Nick on a couple pat couple patents with Nick, yeah, for router table and um, a router table insert, right? Right. Um, Nick and I are named together on those. Um, so I'm I'm no Thomas Edison, but or or Charles Kettering, but I've got a couple. Which and yeah. This one on the wall is, you know, something that I worked hard for and she had that, had that made and I didn't have any idea and really surprised me with it. That's really neat. I like, I think a lot of folks are under the impression that, okay, you invent something, you get a patent for it, and then somehow or another, the money begins flowing because you've invented something that's been patented. It's now earning you money. And that's just, there's so many patents that went nowhere, you know? So it's very cool that many of the things that, that you were involved in actually came to market. And, and there, are, I'm, I know for a fact, there are some things that are at one time up on the mezzanine above, above R&D that your fingers had touched that never made it to market. Uh, <laughs> there, there's, there's one patent in particular that's really interesting to me um, and I don't, I'm not sure what your involvement on it was, but there was a, a, a height adjustable base that was designed 
that that really what I think what we've seen from it is double tilt that came out of it. You know that that whole concept um, is is there if you can mention it, you tell me if you can mention, was there anything that you thought was going to be a real winner that never made it for one reason or another? Well, that that base is one of them. It was just the way it was made, it was impractical to cast and machine. Um, it was such a large casting and um, the machining was minimal because the, the stampings that were added into it um, eliminated a lot of the machining. Um, but it, it just required a level of tooling and machining um, and casting that was not available at the time. Uh, and so it really wasn't, it wasn't a practical alternative. And like you said, the, the double tilt base came out of that. It was, it's a simplified version of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've seen from customers and I've told customers this, I said, you know, if the lathe seems too low for you, put it on a four by four. Yeah. And, um, you can you can pick up one end at a time, set up on a four by four, in less than a minute, and um, then slide those under your workbench when you're not using it for a lathe. It's pretty simple change. Is there a product that Shopsmith once actually produced? What any of the Shopsmiths, right? Any of the the, the Magna Engineering, Magna American, Yuba, Shopsmith Incorporated. Is there a product that is no longer in production that you would love to see back in production? No, not not really. Um, there's the the jigsaw had the pillar files on it. Uh, you could take the arm off of the jigsaw and, and just to use the files. That was real handy, but yeah. we replaced it with this. Basically, we replaced that with a strip sander, and the strip sander um, works very well for that. You can feed it inside of small items uh using a small half inch platen it's um uh, it works very well um we tried reintroducing the air compressor um and it it doesn't fill a tank mm -hmm. so it is demand operated it it really is not a practical um practical air compressor. We couldn't make it for uh, a competitive price. So we we didn't sell even the second generation where Ingersoll ran was um, helping us out, working with us. We still couldn't sell it for what we needed to, to make money and make it attractive to customers. And really it was just a, a at the time, I mean, it was a blow-off tool. Um, yeah. It would it would power nail guns. It was it was something that had to be run on its own, uh, so it really wasn't a, a practical addition to the to the shopsmith um, family. Yeah, um, router tables have kind of gone by this by the same trail, if you will. Um, they were easy enough to set up, but used so seldom. Um, and people have gone to standalone router tables or handheld routing with other jigs that our router tables have, um, we've, we've lost sales and they've, they fell out of favor and, yeah. um, we've had to discontinue them. Because I've, I've always found them to be in the way. I mean, they're, they're just, like you say, you use them, you put them on, you use them, and then you got to take them off again. Yeah. Um, but in a different way than, it, I don't feel that way about a, about a, uh, about a joiner, but I do about, about a router table. It's interesting. I, I think that's because the joiners use more often. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we've got shaping and routing capabilities on the mark that, that, take care of the the routing mm -hmm. um and so you don't have to add an auxiliary table to it and mount a 
uh, somebody else's router to the bottom of it. How about how about a small thing? You know, like you like the the conical disc that was around back in the '60s in in a different form, but a conical disc yeah, that came back. Was there any any other product? You showed me at one time that Shopsmith had were they carbide tipped blades on chisels? I mean, there was like a five piece chisel set that was sold years ago. Did they have carbide braised on them or maybe it was high speed steel? What was it? They had cobalt. Cobalt. Yeah. And, and I think it was maybe four pieces. There were two gouges, a skew and a party tool. tool. Yeah. Uh, they had cherry handles on them. Yeah. I've got a set of them. When was that done? Um, when was it done? Yeah, it was during during the woodworking unlimited days. Um, in the I guess mid nineties when we had okay. those when we tried to convert the stores to woodworking unlimited from Shopsmith. Yeah. Um, and then um, we had. Yeah, the vast variety of of woodworking tools that really ended up competing with us yeah. instead of complementing us. Yeah. Um, they went from woodworking unlimited to wood turning unlimited, and we had those chisels during both those times. But those were those were handy. They were just were you know really expensive. Right. Uh, at the time. Fifty, sixty dollars for a tool was like paying. Uh, I mean, there's there's tools out there now for that, and and even double. But yeah, you know, that was when turning chisels were twelve, fifteen dollars a piece, and right. now the same turning chisels are are thirty dollars, forty dollars a piece for the standard chisel, and um, so it's it's um, they. They didn't sell well. They didn't last long. Um, I use my set. They stay sharp forever. I, I bought them to turn curly cherry. Mm. I was making a, a high chair for my sister's firstborn son, uh, which is still sitting in the attic. Um, yes. <laughs> Wait, her son is still in the attic? No, the chair is still in the attic. Oh, that's I better. Never, yeah, the, the chair is still <laughs> in the attic. I never did finish it because... I, I didn't, uh, I got the spindles all turned and got lost in the, in the tray mechanism. And by the time I, I got that figured out, um, he had outgrown the high chair. <laughs> wow. So, get, it, get it done for when he's got kids. <laughs> he's already got one. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It, it, and, and I really do think this is my last question, Jim. <clears throat> Is, is there, in your mind, an underrated tool or accessory sold by Shopsmith? Probably the belt sander. Um, the belt sander is the, the final finesse tool. It lets you take the overhanging, proud parts and joinery that's sticking out and make everything smooth and flush again. I mean, if you're if you want proud joinery, finger joints, for example, and making a, a green and green or a Frank Lloyd Wright type of piece um, where the, the joinery is, is proud, sticks out, mortises, finger joints, whatever, that's great. But if you're if you're making a modern box, it's finger jointed together. Uh, you can use the, the belt sander and sand everything smooth and flush. You can do angles on it. You can do compound angles on it. The miter gauge fits in the miter gauge slot. It locks in just like it does on the on the table with the expanding screw. Uh, it's very versatile. Uh, it can be used horizontally, vertically. Uh, everything from from grinding you know, heavy cuts of wood off with the coarsest belts to almost polishing tools for sharpening on the yeah. on the finest belts um belt sander is the the tool that i have setting on a stand the shops belt sander sits on a stand and it's it's a go-to with 
every project, whether it's uh, grinding some wood down. I'd rather use a belt sander than a disc sander, frankly, because I can control the direction of the the belt to go with the grain rather than cross grain. Right. Um, there's a, so, a very, very popular YouTube woodworker. He, his channel's usually either the most popular or second most popular, Matthias Wandel. Um, he makes a lot of wooden tools, wooden band saws and things like that. And one thing he has in the shop is a Shopsmith belt sander. One, one production tool still, even though he's built belt sanders, he still keeps that one in his shop. So I think you're exactly right there. It's, it's easy to adjust. Uh, the tracking, no tools required, um, fingertip adjustment. At the most, you use the Shopsmith Allen wrench. It's yeah. already in your pocket. Um, so it's, you know, it's versatile. It's handy. It's, 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 the, it's probably the underrated tool of the, of the product line. I think you're um, right. Very, very good point. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with us. Um, I, I, I know I, I think of the most underrated thing at Shopsmith, and it's Jim McCann. <laughs> now, you, you, you really you. have been a, 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 sta a steadying, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You, no, you've been a, such a constant influence there. And uh, it's, I, I think, in no small part of uh, folks at Shopsmith were to stop and look at what, what keeps the lights on. Uh, it's a lot of the things that you do. And uh, I, I appreciate you. I well, appreciate, appreciate you. Thank you. Your yeah. kind words are, are very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Take, take a little extra 20 bucks or so out of petty cash this week, Jim. <laughs> okay. I'll tell, I'll tell Bob that you approve that. No problem. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Jim. And uh, viewer, you all have make it a great day. <laughs>